I am never surprised by the many ways that unbelievers have found to dishonor the name of Christ or ridicule the gospel and Christians in general. Never surprised when I see, oh, a new version of that game being played. For example, when, I was in, uh, when we were in Montreal, there was an editorial cartoon in the local paper, it's called the Montreal Gazette, same thing as the Daily Oklahoman. And in that cartoon, it showed the cross, you know, Montreal's an island and there's a kind of a, a mountain on, in the middle of the island and on top of the mountain, there's a, this big huge cross that's there and it's lit up it uh, you know, can be seen for miles. It's a landmark, it's, it's a famous landmark, <clears throat> excuse me, in Montreal. Well, the cartoonist had shown that cross on Mount Royal wearing a Montreal Canadiens hockey sweater. So the artist thought this was going to be a cute way a clever way of merging two of Montreal's great symbols the Catholic Church, the cross, and the Montreal Canadian hockey team, the hockey sweater. Of course, had any other group been so insulted? Had any other religious group's symbols been so trivialized? Everyone would have been up in arms and rushed to denounce the cartoonist and the Gazette in defense of that group and their religion. But this was an insult to Christians. And as everyone knows in our society today, Christianity is fair game for ridicule without consequence. I'm insulted, like I said, but never surprised at the new and creative ways that the world finds to blaspheme the Son of God. I am surprised and disappointed, however, when those who claim to be disciples and believers manage to do the very same thing while using the name of Christian or Christ. A good example of this is provided by a group called the Jesus Seminar. The Jesus Seminar. This is a group of about 150 scholars, mostly from East Coast, extremely liberal universities, you know, like Harvard or Princeton. And it was founded in 1985 by the late Robert Funk. Their approach is to treat the Gospels as a collection of human writings that contain only some of Jesus' actual words and the what they call fictional writings of early Christian disciples. Their seminars are open to the public and their stated goal is to present an accurate historical picture of Jesus. So they review historical records, archeology span and other sources to come to their conclusions and pronouncements using an unusual voting system. They use colored beads, a colored bead method of voting on the relative truth or accuracy of various Bible ideas and teachings. For example, if one of the members puts a, a, a red bead into the jar, uh, then that voter believes that the act or the saying in the Bible that they happen to be examining is genuine. If on the other hand, they put a pink bead into the jar concerning that passage or a subject that they're studying, well, that means they think it's probably true. A gray bead, well, that means that Jesus didn't say the actual words, but some of his ideas may be behind these words. And then a black bead, here the idea or the words are not from Jesus, but from some source other than Jesus and attributed to the Lord. And so using this method, they actually vote on the accuracy of the Bible record of Jesus' miracles, His words, His teachings, and His resurrection. 
Now, there are a great many biblical scholars that dismiss this group for a, variety, for a variety of reasons. Again, for example, only a few, maybe 14 or 15 out of the 150 of this group are actually serious Bible scholars. Many of them have degrees in unrelated fields like engineering or mathematics. Their voting using a consensus method is not a valid academic research method. Could you imagine Marty preparing a sermon throughout the week and you see this big jar on his desk and as he's going through the Bible, he's putting in different colored beads to realize, well, this may be true, this isn't true. You know? And then he goes through the beads and he counts them and whoever bead wins, that's going to be his sermon? Maybe jelly beans, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know, there. The most serious flaw, of course, is that they put as much credibility in documents written about Jesus two centuries later as they do in the New Testament itself, written by actual eyewitnesses and disciples of Jesus. So even though this group is not taken seriously by legitimate biblical scholars, they attract a lot of attention and publicity with their pronouncements because their pronouncements are covered by Time Magazine and the New York uh, Times and you know, they get a lot of free publicity. Now, most people take what they say as being accurate, not knowing how to properly analyze and response their wild claims. You know, the idea is, well, if the Jesus Seminar, oh, these are smart people, if they said it, I guess it must be true. One such claim several years ago was that the resurrection of Jesus was not true. There were a lot of black beads in the jar on that particular vote. This declaration was the climax of a series of votes that also rejected miracles, the virgin birth, and other basic teachings in the Bible concerning Jesus, his life, and his ministry. Now, what was most offensive was that this so-called Jesus Seminar timed their news release to coincide with the Easter weekend in order to maximize the insult to Christians and their foolish pride before God. They could have released the information any time, but they made sure to release it on Easter weekend. When you hear this type of teaching from those who call themselves Christians, and they call it the Jesus Seminar, and who claim great knowledge and take the position of teachers, the words of Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, take on a chilling reality. He said, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Now, even though these people attract those who ridicule and deny, I am glad that at least twice a year, you know, Christmas and Easter, the world focuses on Jesus' birth and resurrection because it gives us an opportunity to talk about not only His birth, but all three of the resurrections described in the New Testament. You know, we focus so much on Jesus' resurrection that we overlook the fact that in the Bible there is prophecy and description of three resurrections, not just one. I don't count, somebody was saying to me, what about Lazarus, you know, is, is he one of the ones? You know, does he, is he one of the three? Well, I don't count Lazarus' uh, resurrection, John 11, or the resurrection of the many saints in Jerusalem right after Jesus died, Matthew 27, because these people, along with those that Jesus resurrected during his ministry, would face death once again. So their resurrection was you know, temporary. You know, Lazarus, yeah, he brought him back from the dead, but Lazarus eventually died again. I'm talking about the three permanent resurrections. Now, many factors concerned with this event, but the main things to remember about the first resurrection, which is Jesus' resurrection, is that his resurrection was prophesied. The resurrection was not an afterthought or a plan B operation to patch up a botched ministry. Some people actually believe that. 
They think that, well, you know, that Jesus dying was like an accident. That was not supposed to happen. So the resurrection was tacked on, you know, to kind of give a happy ending. That Jesus would live as a man and then die and then resurrect was planned by God from the beginning and spoken about throughout the Bible. In Genesis 3 and 15, God alludes to the Christ and how Satan would temporarily stop him, meaning bruise his heel. But with the resurrection, Christ would destroy Satan, you know, crush his head. In Acts chapter 2, verse 31, Peter claims that Daniel, 700 years before Jesus, spoke of the fact that the Messiah would resurrect. In John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus himself alluded not only to his own resurrection, but the number of days in which it would be accomplished. So it's not like an afterthought. It was spoken of hundreds of years before and consistently throughout biblical history. Also, the resurrection was the proof of Jesus' divinity. Many had done miracles of the same nature and power of Jesus in the past. Many had claimed to be the Messiah in the past. But Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 4 that the resurrection is what proved Jesus to be the Son of God with power. Someone says, well, how do I know? What proof does the Bible give that Jesus is the Messiah? What, you know, what's the, you know, the bottom line? Is it the miracle? Is it that he walked on the water, that he multiplied the fish and the, no. Those are all miracles obviously pointing to his true identity. But the number one proof that he is the Son of God, chosen by God to come, is the resurrection. If people wanted an undeniable sign of who was to be the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, the Holy One, the Lord, the divine Son of God, the resurrection was the sign, the only sign that God provided for this end. Of all the religious leaders, past and present, only Jesus was raised because He's the one God wants us to follow. And so Jesus' resurrection is the first and foremost of the resurrections in the Bible, but it's not the last. The second resurrection is the resurrection of believers, of course. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Paul, in talking about Jesus' resurrection, reminds his readers that his resurrection was only the first in a series of resurrections to come. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. You know, farmers look at the first blooms, the first fruits of their crop, that signal that the entire harvest will soon be ready to pick. Many had believed in the past and uh, hoped for a resurrection in the future. In Psalm 49, 15, the writer said, but God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. David, more than almost all others, articulated this idea that there was a life after death that, that he and all those who believed could actually look forward to. But until Jesus, the confirmation of that hope was always on the horizon, something that was hoped for, something that was promised but not seen yet. The resurrection of Jesus fulfilled the promise and secured the hope of believers that this thing called resurrection was indeed possible because Jesus actually accomplished it. And so Paul's comment on the first fruits is actually saying his is the first but not the last of the resurrections. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 17, Paul gives the details as to when this resurrection will happen. And I'd like to read that particular passage. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, that by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive 
and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And so Jesus was the first and the believers are the second when Jesus returns. If He appeared once and resurrected once, He will appear a second time for the second resurrection, which is our own. You know, I feel sorry for those who ridicule and deny the resurrection of Jesus because in doing so they are ridiculing and denying the possibility of their own resurrection leaving them laughing perhaps, but laughing with no hope. The third resurrection. Well, the third resurrection is the resurrection of the creation. You know, we talk least about this one because we know the least about this one. We have details about the resurrected Jesus, you know, how He was physically present he spoke, he listened, you could touch him, he was humanly recognizable, and yet his nature had changed, he appeared and disappeared, he ascended into heaven. You know, we have some glimpses of him in his resurrected state. We also have some descriptions about our own resurrected state in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says that we will be conscious and we will be able to communicate. We will also be recognizable, but our natures will be changed like angels and thus have their powers and capabilities as well. And we will no longer be subject to sin or decay or death. Again, these are ideas given to us to help us understand what will our nature be when we are resurrected. We have less information about the resurrection of the creation. But the Bible, however, does refer to it. Uh, in Romans chapter eight, if you want to go there, beginning in verse 18, Paul writes the following. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the, revel the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And so Paul equates the longing to be free from sin and death in order to be with God to the same type of yearning that the creation experiences in its innate desire to be free from decay and ultimate destruction because of sin. The point here is that God's perfect creation also suffered because of sin and the final results will be that its present condition and form will be destroyed when Jesus comes. And so in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, Peter uh, expresses it in this way. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now when we take this passage and we put them together alongside Romans 8 and we go to Revelation 21 and 1 where John writes, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. We see the resurrection of the creation. The old creation is polluted by man's sin and doomed to ultimate destruction. The violence, the struggle to survive, the collective sigh of despair is witness to this. But at the return of the resurrected Jesus, the signal to the resurrection of the believers, and of course, disbelievers will be condemned and sent to punishment. This old creation at this time will pass away and a new one will be 
resurrected. Just as God will resurrect a new man fitted for eternal life, He will also resurrect a new heaven and earth as a suitable dwelling place for resurrected man. It will not be an improved earth or heaven where we live in a similar fashion as we do now for a number of years. It will be a resurrected creation like our bodies will be resurrected bodies with an eternal nature. Now the Bible does give us some information concerning what this will be like. For example, no need of sun or moon because there will be no night there. Romans. Uh, excuse me, Revelation 21. Remember now, I, I'm, talking about, uh, you know, I'm talking about an experience that we will have after death in, as a glorified body, but I'm only projecting ahead what this may be like using terms that we have now. I don't, I've never met an angel. <laughs> I've not been to that place. I'm only trying to project ahead with human words and human ideas what it might be like so that we would understand in human ways something that is purely spiritual in nature. So keep that in mind as I go through this. No need for sun or moon, no need for light because there'll be no darkness there. No sea there, Revelation 21. A prepared city where God will dwell with His people in a precious surrounding of jewels and precious gold. Again, could be metaphors for beauty beyond our imagination. The tree of life and the river flowing from God's throne will be there. Again, imagery, but imagery representing what? Well, imagery representing the fact that there's no, no illness there, no death there, no need there, no hunger there, no lust there, no greed there, no pride there. And of course, the Bible says, no tears, no pain, no sorrow, no unclean thing, no death, no Satan, no condemnation, just no condemnation. Can you imagine what it would be like to live our lives with no condemnation, no thought of condemnation ever again? I mean, just that alone is heaven right there. God turns defeat into victory by saving and resurrecting man in glory. And he does the same by resurrecting in perfection the creation that he originally designed for man to live in. Do you think for a moment that God doesn't care about his creation? Think now for a second. The beauty, the majesty of it, the complexity of it, how marvelous it is in so many ways. Just studying a simple flower and it's so complex. You know, that little bug that you step on that, you know, oh, there's a bug and you, you just step on it. Do you realize the engineering that you have just destroyed? No, think about it. You know, flies are nasty. They get in your way, they get in your soup, you know. But do, do you realize the flying machine that's going around there? That only exists for what, a couple of days? Do we think that God doesn't care about this magnificent thing that He created and that man has polluted? Do you, do you think He doesn't care about that? We read in Peter, well, the elements will burn up, the, you know, the earth is gone, so okay, okay, no, you know, no harm, no foul. We did this. We caused the fact that all of this has to be destroyed and brought back. We did this and it's no small thing brethren. I tell you when we come before God in judgment and thankfully we'll be free of judgment because we're in Christ. The relief that we will feel uh, is unimaginable because the depth of our sin is also unimaginable. We do not know the bullet that we are dodging as Christians. 
we have no idea of how deep and how awful it is. And so God brings back a new creation, a place for us to exist. And so as I said at the very beginning, it's nothing new for the world not to believe in the resurrection, but for the saints, the resurrection is the event that we have spent our entire lives preparing for. So let us therefore be convinced of all three. The resurrection of Jesus Christ as a signal that death was not final and that He was the true Son of God and the Savior of our souls. And then the resurrection of believers now made possible by Jesus' resurrection and which we anticipate each time we meet for communion. Because each time we meet for communion may be the last time. So give thanks sincerely. You know where Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians, you know, we take the communion and we, we proclaim his, his death until he comes. Until he comes is not just until he comes at the end of the world. It could also be until he comes for you tonight. And be convinced of the resurrection of the creation which God will accomplish in order to provide for His sons and daughters a new and eternal home suitable for their glorious resurrected bodies. Just as our physical bodies could not exist as it is in the spiritual world, our glorious bodies would not be able to exist in the physical world. And so he creates a new heaven and a new earth to enable us to exist in our new and glorified bodies. These things being so, because God cannot lie, let us face the world with a mixture of confidence and compassion. Confidence that despite the disbelief and rejection now, God will keep his promise to resurrect all believers as well as his creation. And compassion, because those who disbelieve have so little time and so little joy in this corrupt world. And so I encourage all of our brothers and all of our sisters, do not lose hope. Remain faithful, because he is faithful who has promised. I encourage those who desire resurrection, but who have not yet confess their belief. I encourage you, shake off your pride and confess Christ, be baptized in His name that you might also look forward to the two resurrections to come. If you need to respond to today's invitation, I do encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.